Uh, so the next talk is the talk on Libre Silicon, a uh, project that's meant to create a free and open silicon manufacturing process. And our speakers today are Leviathan, Chipforge, and Andreas Westerwick, uh, creators of Libre Silicon. So let's give them a warm round of applause. <laughs> and please welcome them. essentially is all this fuss about is actually a description of how we what this wafer means and where we will go with it um, and yeah I give now already over to Hagen which already starts elaborating on the basic conceptual things Okay, hello everybody. Um, hope you have a fresh mind. It could be heavy. Um, okay, uh, let's start. Uh, what we are. Um, last year, um, David was involved at uh, the project to looking for free silicon, just a way to manufacture his own chips and figured out it's difficult. You need a lot of contracts for that, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. So he looked around and find a clean room. We had to come in and say, okay, we can rent it. Then he entered the scene on the last Congress, on the lightning talk, and said, I like to do that. And I wasn't in the auditorium there, but a guy told me later, okay, look at this lightning talk. It's very interesting. You already doing chips. So I entered in, see the, uh, seen the talk and uh, recording, and said, nice idea, I will do that too. And now uh, the whole year we meet us by Mumble. It's just a thing of distance, you know. David is located in Hong Kong. Uh, the clean room is there. And I worked from Germany. So we ch exchanged in emails, we talked on a mailing list, we built up a small community for that. And we had a first hackathon just to figure out uh, what we are doing with the tools, which tools are available, how we can use them, are they usable at all or not. And this was in May. And uh, during the process, the group rised up, and already two of us get the, uh, the qualification to enter the clean room. The Hong Kong University is a little bit strict in that. You have to uh, sitting there in the courses, you have to do exams, and if you are fine with the exams, then you get the permissions to go in. So Victor, which is on the most left, and David are the both guys. They have the qualification for that, and they fab, uh, yeah, they manufacture our wafer, which you have seen there. It's a small one, but it's the first stuff we have, right? Okay, the basic points, what we are doing. We are using a quite, let's say, old technology. It's from the 80s. It's one micron meter uh, feature size. It means the uh, gate length of the transistor has one micron. It's not comparable with all the processors you can buy now. It's quite old. It's really stuff from the 80s. But we do it on a new way. We don't use the technology from the 80s. We do it with the uh, knowledge and all the experience uh, from newer technology. Doing it again and using some steps which are not so common or wasn't common in the 80s. So why one uh, why one micron? One micron also means that the transistors are very robust against 5 volt. 5 volt was a usual uh, supply voltage in the 80s, 90s, or something like that. Um, now the supply voltage is going down, down to 
less than one volt. But for tinkerer, for hobbyists, for makers, it's a f nice value because all the stuff, many of boards are still working with five volts. And we are able to handle this voltage. So we have a twin well process. Usually in the 80s there was just one well. Okay, uh, we have to hurry up. We have three metal layers, we have ad interesting additions, and we are suitable for low tech, ghetto tech, I would say. You can use it without sophisticated equipment. We can analog stuff and so on. And analog stuff means you don't need small structures. Okay, or areas where we have to work on, first the process. It's almost done. We have figured it out, it works, we're measuring, okay. The next stuff, we need the tools. But the tools are also very, very old and mostly not usable. We have to deal with that stuff. We have to rethink the tooling for that. And we need standard cells. That's my task. Okay, so a couple of words about standard cells. They are very common. Usually, uh, if you have a need to translate your Verilog or VHDL and to bring it on a silicon, you need small gates, NAND gates, OR gates, and so on. But this gates needs a lot of representation. They're combinatorial sequences. So, okay, these are typical cells, just a couple of them. But imagine, we need much, much more. And the design goals for the standard cells are we need almost complete uh, possibilities. If you have just a small uh, selection of cells, the netlist becomes huge. And uh, every gate in the netlist also means a de dedicated delay. If you have long change, we have a long delay, so that our operating frequency goes down. So we, if you have a more complex gate, we are better. But doing all this stuff is, is heavy. But we like to um, be low power. It means our cells have to be consumption less power than usual. We want to be fast. But yes, of course, it doesn't fit all together. Okay, cell for simulation we need it. We need it for synthesis. We need it for timing, as you can see everywhere on the fold, uh, slides. And of course, documentation. Um, <coughs> that's a lot of work. We are a small team. I am the only guy with dealing with the standard cells. Usually our teams also doing that. So okay, we need a tool for that, which does all the stuff for us. And this cell grenade, I called it popcorn, because I put in some corn and it rised up with the heat. So, okay, we, we get all the representation. So, um, usually, um, well, um, currently, I have a tool uh, on the repository, which is Tackle, which does some stuff I like, I need, but not all. But it already seems very ugly. So for me, I like to rewrite it, but I don't figure out currently which language I like to use for that next time. It could be Rust, it could be Scheme, or something like that. We need another language for that. So if someone won't help, please. But it's the next task if we have the wafer done completely and measured. Okay. That's a, a link for the repository where you can look at the queue and status. And uh, there's a wiki where I like to describe why I'm doing what in which way. But yes, we have to do it a lot. Still more. Okay. Okay, hi. Uh, I took, uh, I take a look at the uh, current tooling that exists, like layouting, place and route to uh, minimize the yield on the wafer. And uh, obviously, because this is a Libra Silicon project, we look at open source tools. So we have Yosis and Cravolf, QRouter, and several other FPGA routers that exist. Um, 
Yosa is, uh, is pretty good. We can probably use this for the synthesis, uh, but uh, the other tools, they lack uh, very uh, critical qualities um, for this for silicon because they, in, for example, they are part of Qflow, which is uh, an FPGA workflow. Uh, so the the Grey Wolf tool it originates uh, in academia. It's like uh, it's many decades old. Uh, it comes with some very good ideas. For example, simulated annealing. Which, uh, which is a meta heuristic you can use uh, to solve uh, NP hard problems, but it's only one of the uh, many choices you can make to solve uh, the, the uh, extra hard problems. Um, but it also comes with uh, bad implementation. For example, uh, inline uh, syscalls is a very bad idea. Um, and it's also written in C and blah, blah, okay. <coughs> Um, Q router is actually uh, it's pretty good. It started in 2011 by Tim Edwards. Um, it's widely used for uh, by hobbyists and enthusiasts uh, to uh, to route for FPGAs, but it's not ready for silicon, and it's especially not ready for uh, our Libra silicon process, which would require us to. Uh, to uh, to to write a lot of uh, C code for Q router. Um, also, um, parallelism apparently is not in scope. So, I mean, if we want to scale up, uh, for example, place and route in the cloud or whatever, or use uh, modern CPU architectures, um, we are stuck with sequ sequential routing, which is pretty bad. Um, also, it lacks a very important aspect, uh, in my opinion, which is formal correctness. So, um, when we produce wafers in the fab, uh, we want to make sure that they don't blow up in our faces. Um, this is why uh, we need some form, some form of proof that our alg algorithms are correct, and therefore the result is correct. Um, there are also other productive tools that are proprietary, um, which, uh, where we can look at, but we cannot use it or fork it or whatever, but we can learn from um, the research that has been done. For example, BonRoute. Uh, BonRoute is uh, used by IBM. Uh, the Cadence Suite, I believe, is used by Intel. Um, and the Alliance Tools uh, is, uh, is French Academia. Uh, very unix -y. I mean, it has a very, uh, it's a very large set of small tools that convert different file formats to another. I mean, maybe you encountered this problem before when you uh, did some hardware design, you have many different file formats that don't, uh, all don't play together very well. So uh, you have tools like X to Y, <laughs> which convert uh, file format X to Y. Um, and you see, when you want to place and route and lay out a very, very large chip, like a uh, very large silicon integration, then uh, this isn't even done like automatically by tools. This is uh, done with manpower when you look at a uh, very large chip done by Intel or IBM. So this is an example of a very, very large chip. Um, as you can see, I mean, do you think this has been done by automation, like Industry 5.0? No, this is this is all manpower and a lot of manpower, which we don't have <laughs> in the Libra Silicon project at the moment. Mm. So this is this the state of the art is like okay, the manpower is thing is uh, one aspect, but uh, the other thing is um, so what what you do is uh, you you do placing and routing at this um, at uh, different uh, at different steps at the design process. So you do placing for a very large chip, uh, floor planning, and then you do a global routing, um, which is uh, you, you can imagine it like uh, routing along a, a rough chessboard. And after that, you do a, ver a very detailed routing where all the different constraints regarding your technology come into play. And um, so, again, the formal correctness aspect. So you, you have some imperative algorithm that you cannot prove uh, will blow up. 
and it's also not a very parallel code. So you you're still stuck with uh, the 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 sequential nature of uh, the code, and uh, you, you have no parallelism. What what we propose is um, to not place and route for large chip, but decompose the large chip into uh, into much smaller units like a component hierarchy or a subcell hierarchy, and then place and route the small chips at the same time, and then reuse the small units in larger units. So you get an evaluation tree. You can you can work on and uh, compile just the components you need. Mm. Also, um, we, we propose uh, satisfiability modulo theory solvers, um, so we can have some first order logic um, that uh, where we can have constraints uh, on uh, the components how they are placed. For example, uh, they they don't. For example, they must not overlap. That's like the most simple example. I will show you uh, like uh, later. And um, also, we want uh, we want to achieve uh, a parallel or declarative code. Mm. So, as you as you can see, we have some we have many disagreements with uh, academia and industry, which. Uh, work very well together. For example, when you want to study <laughs> semiconductor design, you have to uh, sign some NDAs with IBM or Intel to do that. Um, so <coughs> um, they say placement and routing or floor planning and routing are different problems, and they need to be solved at different times in the process. And then all uh, all the components it can be re registers or NAND gates, it doesn't matter, they're all treated the same. Uh, it only matters that uh, the floor planning is done first, and then the routing, the closed routing, then the detailed routing. What, what, what we propose is that place and route is actually the same problem, and that registers are different from uh, full adders. Okay, so the, the geographical partitioning of a wafer uh, is uh, called floor planning or uh, the placing uh, step. And uh, this results in a cut tree. So this is uh, how they do routing hierarchies. They uh, just divide the wafer into smaller pieces and then uh, do the following steps based on this placement. Uh, what we want to do is have subcell hierarchies and those subcells, they are, um, they are um, either explicit, like they are explicitly developed. Uh, for example, the rocket ship is very modular, and uh, it uh, it has uh, many explicit Verilog modules you can use and place and route that, and then reuse it. And it also has implicit um, subcells, like for example. Uh, most of the time, uh, uh, for example, you have a full adder. It obviously is composed of one-bit adders, so you can place and route a uh, one-bit adder, and then place and route uh, based on the one-bit adders that you already place and routed, and as a result, you get a full adder. That's just one example, but I will show you uh, a tree, uh, a few slides. <laughs> um, so there you see a parallelism is uh, something very important for us. Uh, bon route uh, allocates a lot of research to uh, have some mathematical model uh, for concurrency and uh, shared memory models. Uh, QRouter, which is the open source alternative, uh, has none. I mean, it's apparently not in scope. And uh, what I propose for the LibreSilicon compiler is uh, the map and reduce approach. Um, as, I've, as I've mentioned, um, you get explicit subcell hierarchies through high modularization. That is, this is done by the developers. And you also get implicit subcell hierarchies by compression like algorithms that uh, X line. Uh, as, as opposed to inline uh, the registers or one-bit adders. 
And uh, this is also about preserving these new found hierarchies uh, in the uh, compiler interfaces so you, you, you don't end up inlining them again. Because this is not a von Neumann architecture where it would make sense to inline a lot of code. So the code runs on the stack in the level one cache. Uh, this is about uh, reusing components. Okay, so um, this is a part of the uh, uh, rocket chip. Uh, the system bus is one component of a very modular chip, rocket chip. And as you can see, uh, it is composed of uh, several simple lazy modules, and those simple modules are uh, again composed of other components. And then you have a lot of queues, and uh, this number on the left says how, how many times it's been used. Uh, for example, uh, a Q15 is used five times in the AXI4 uh, D interleaver. And um, this is only the explicit hierarchy that is declared by the developer. Okay. Um, now, when you apply some compression like algorithms, you can uh, actually gain, uh, you can get more leaves, uh, so you can uh, be even more modular. For example, Q1. Uh, is composed of uh, several implicit modules, and you can see one one queue is even reused seven times. So you just route, place and route the uh, the this uh, green leaves like once, and then you can reuse it in the Q1 and everywhere where Q1 is reused some uh, at some other point in the chip. Now uh, I want to uh, state a very simple optimization problem. Um, like w what we need for the process is uh, to have components and uh, wires that connect the components or nets. And these uh, nets and components uh, are rectilinear uh, geometries. Uh, the components shall not overlap and the nets shall overlap with the respective pins they are supposed to connect. The minimizing goals of this optimization problem is layout area, which is the most critical one because this is what maximizes the yield. Uh, the maximum wire length, uh, because it's about resistance. Uh, the wire count uh, you want to keep uh, very small, but uh, you, sh you want to allow for wires. Um, the, the, the crossing number is uh, a computational thing. It's, it doesn't really matter for the implementation on the silicon. And you also want maybe want to minimize uh, wire jocks, which is bends in the wire. <coughs> so to, to solve um, optimization problems in 2018, uh, maybe you want to use an abstraction from the uh, uh, SAT solvers uh, you used to know. Um, academia came up with some uh, pretty neat uh, uh, theories called satisfiability modular theories. And you can uh, just put some um, first order logic uh, and give it to a solver. Um, for example, I've listed a few. Uh, for example, ABC is used by Yosis and uh, Z3 from Microsoft is also a very promising product. But you can uh, obviously choose from many products by academia and industry. Um, just a quick reminder uh, what Boolean satisfiability is. Uh, find assignments for all these six variables, which are Boolean, so that uh, the whole term is true. And now with SMT, or satisfiability modular theories, you can, you can do the same thing, but now with integers. And uh, also more complex data types, but integers are the most interesting. Um, so let's do something with SMT. Uh, for example, let's um, have a component that is rectangular. And um, now you can see this is like a Cartesian coordinate system. And you have uh, the left bottom point, which is x and y. And then you have the right and the top point. And now if you, if you for example, have this problem that you don't want to have overlapping uh, rectangles, uh, you can have uh, rectangle A and rectangle B and uh, declare these uh, coordinates and then have some uh, proposition that uh, shall be true. 
And um, to have a proposition that says uh, they shall not overlap is to say this. I mean, it's actually the lower half that is the lower half makes sure that they don't overlap, and the, the upper half uh, makes sure that uh, the components actually have the right dimensions. Well, in this example, they obviously have the same dimensions, the same components, and um, so you, you make sure that the, the left point of the second rectangle is, uh, is like uh, uh, right of the... Uh, oh, okay, no, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, one, uh, one last uh, important point I want to make is that uh, the, this, this framework we want to create um, it's not based on the in inheritance model that we've seen in the uh, in the in the process steps uh, right now, but uh, we want to combine the problems, for example, the overlapping problem, the pin connect problem, and then arbitrary constraints that come up during the process development that Dave and uh, Hagen will supply me with, and I will formulate that in first order logic, and then uh, this makes sure it's formally correct and it doesn't blow up. And as you can tell, I mean, I've, I've combined many NP-hard problems at the same time, but I think we can manage that if we have very small cells. So I'd suggest we just stay here and uh, don't do all this for very large chips, but uh, reuse small chips and then reuse the small chips and other small chips. The silicon compiler is it's one, one half of uh, maximizing yield, and the other half is to get the process right. So to get the process right, we have David and Victor. So please. Um, so thanks for the handover here. So very first, um, there's a lot of questions why Hong Kong. So one thing where we but this is a really suitable place to do that is because of history like the epic commodore 64 has been made in hong kong then the chips in the first macintosh have been made in hong kong and all these manufacturing lines some of them at least one is still available so also there is a very advanced uh, laboratory that's the, Hong uh, the NFF, Nanofabrication Facility, in Clearwater Bay. And they let us kindly use their equipment to develop this process. Also, the one of these factories I men mentioned before, RCL Semiconductors, they're really open to introduce Libre Silicon in their mass manufacturing lines, one in Sanjian, one in Taipo. Um, yeah, so also in conclusion of that, we have advanced R&T labs there. Um, the, there is factories available. We can easily export it to here over, the, uh, over channels which already exist, right? And also in general, it's just more relaxed over there. <laughs> and I, I don't like minus degrees. <laughs> So our process <coughs> is a little bit of a monster. So it makes sense um, to, to tackle that one by one. So we're right now feeling ourselves upwards uh, to get the standard CMOS debugged fi final with uh, optimized frequencies there, right? But uh, we already have on the Pearl River, I've shown you, we already have test structures for high voltage MOSFETs, B junction transistors, Zener diodes, uh, Evan flash, uh, resistors, and caps. So, and it's only a question of uh, effort, I've, I guess, in the next few months to get that working. Right. Um, when we designed the process, like, I. I how usually how it usually works when you make a process is you look at the machines you have available what can these machines do optimum op operation range 
Um, then you look what substrate, what material you have available, and then you start tinkering your own little proprietary process. That's how fabs do that. And we said, okay, well, to the point where we look at the machines, what can they do? Um, we, all, we do the same, but afterwards we looked at it's portable, not specific to the equipment. So just because we have uh, certain machines which can do awesome things, but they're uh, really exotic, doesn't mean we have to use them. So we avoid exotic machines um, so that it's as po portable as possible. And we also try to use wet etching whenever possible in order to make sure that you even can build it in a basement. And uh, yeah, <laughs> Evan Heisenberg might be interested now in, in you know, changing business into a less dangerous business. <laughs> and yeah, they even can build it in the Innovation Hub Hamburg, I've seen, like this uh, improvised clean room with just a diffusion furnace. So that's a uh, cross section of the, it's uh, not final list, but you see a cross-section theoretical. That's, by the way, you can find it on GitHub as well. It's all in the publications. Uh, everything we develop, all the measurement data, all is on GitHub. So that's actually the layout of these little squares here on the wafer. Um, that uh, you see the apple in the middle, <laughs> it's this image here. Um, it's, uh, it's nice, I have a Python script in, this, in the GDS2 generator tool folder for Python, and you can take an, any PNG or anything and just convert it into layout format. So you can put your own pictures onto the metal free layer. So in case you uh, already are interested in making <laughs> little chips or so. <laughs> it's also possible to make like um, earrings or so with, uh, we don't care as long as you pay the square millimeters on the silicon. <laughs> um, you can put pictures on the silicon. So, so the that's, that was the Pearl River, right? And the Pearl River ful fulfills the function uh, for us at the moment to debug. The, the the, all the features of our process, of this Libre Silicon process. Then the next thing, um, we have to cal use it to calibrate new foundries. So now we developed it at NFF in, in Clearwater Bay, right? And afterwards we go over to HQ with the, to, to, uh, to the RCL guys, right in Typo, and they have the machines, and then we have to pipe the Pearl River layout through there as well and repeat that process over and over again until the measurement data, like the, uh, the frequent, the, you know, the beta, depending on omega, of the transistors and the resist resistance of the virus and everything kind of is the same as at, M as at NFF. So that you can basically, as I mentioned before, one of the design concerns is portability, that you can basically prototype a chip at NFF and then produce it in RCL or in maybe some other fab in Sunshine or whatever. Uh, so, and if there are new, new features coming out, we just make a new release of the Pearl River MCU, uh, Pearl River uh, test wafer, and we uh, give that around, we push it to GitHub, and people can introduce and calibrate the process to support the new feature. And so that's uh, how does it work. So usually, typically you have something like a photo mask, like here. I didn't bring that one because um, it's in a clean room there, and uh, the dust might scratch my uh, microstructures on there. So also afterwards, I have to clean it for half an hour, and I just when I come back to Hong Kong from here, I'm so jet lagged. I just want to get started again. I don't want to wait for the mask, but that's a picture. And these masks usually are stepper aligner specific. So if you have a stepper aligner, if you don't have a stepper, then you need to make a direct transfer. That means you have to make, you actually have to put the 
chips in the size you want to expose them directly onto the mask, then press the mask onto photo resist, expose and develop. That's messy because you have to clean the mask all the time and it really depends. So actually you can do exposure even without a step. So you actually really could do it also there in this uh, university lab in Hamburg. So all you need is a new UV light. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a little bit more advanced tech in Hong Kong. So we have here an SVG coater. This baby uh, this, uh, dispenses automatically HPR 500 and resist. So we actually just have to put in in the left. You see the cassette slot. So you put there like 25 wafers or so, and then you have a receive slot and put another cassette there. And um, it just starts sucking in the wafers one by one, puts primer on it, soft bakes it, and um, easy. Then you expose it, develop it, hard bake it, chilled. We have two types of resist actually, and the six five. At the, the 6400L for the implantation, unfortunately, has to be um, put in manually. So yeah, it comes and it gives you 10 seconds to open the chamber and put the resist on it. Um, in, in both cases, however, it doesn't really matter so much because the thickness of the resist is depending on the r RPMs of the spin coating unit. So. You just have to kind of put two thirds of the wafer should be somehow covered with the resist, and then you cover, and then it must, and the excess resist goes away. Um, but you have to control the RPMs because depending on how, when you do wet etching, for instance, uh, the HPR 500, uh, 504 has to be enough thick because of selectivity, so that you don't uh, etch, uh, consume, your etchant also consumes the, pol uh, the polymer, the resist. So you have to make it enough thick that you don't have consumed all the polymer before you have etched your structures. And the same goes for the implantation, because you can use, uh, for that you need the 6400L. Uh, this one can sustain higher temperatures, so you can use an uh, uh, implanter. Uh, ah, thanks. But yeah, scatter. Um, okay, now afterwards, after exposure development, it looks like that. Um, that's uh, an alignment cross for our uh, optical stepper. And um, for instance, that's our ring oscillator. So uh, it's one of the structures on our pearl river, actually. So, um, N-well, P-well, I have to hurry up, only 10 minutes, so sorry. <laughs> so that's a picture after developing, we have some P-well mask de developed, so you have everywhere resist except in these little crosses and stripes there, that's there below with the silicon where we implant. So the receipt rece rece is easy, first coat, expose, uh, implant and then re resist strip. Same for the other, for the P-well. And after the resist strip, um, you can put it into a diffusion furnace in inert atmosphere for like for four hours. So where does the four hours come from? So you, we have the fixed equation. And the fixed equation is essentially in a similar shape like the Laplace heat conduction equation, so there's al already nice solutions for it. So for instance, uh, if you use boron and phosphor, which have the nice uh, property that they have the same constants for this DE, so if you have the same temperature, you basically have the same DE for phosphorus and bos boron. So you can implant them next to each other and then put them at once into the diffusion furnace and the wells are the same depth. So that's why these two materials are usually used for diffusion. Um, so that's one of the solutions. With that you get the surface um, the doping uh, for the threshold equation, which I also will rush through in a moment. <coughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah, the equations you see here with background doping, it's a little bit 
much. It's a, the, you have here this uh, nat natural logarithm inside. But besides that, you see this jump, and uh, that's how you essentially build a well. You have the background doping, and you compensate the donors and acceptors with each other. So that's what this absolute value of the difference means. Um, so, so the threshold equation is pretty easy, and they are uh, like basically mirrored for PMOS and NMOS. They're just like mirrored in the sense that one of the transistors. So PMOS is built on an N well, and NMOS is built on a P well, right? Um, and um, what, <coughs> what what essentially controls the threshold voltage, so the operation voltage, which usually in the standard CMOS is around 0 0.8, respectively minus 0 0.8, um, that's the doping here, like the, the donors, respectively acceptors. And the QSS usually, that's the oxide charge, is usually a process-specific constant, um, but it can change. Um, in that, and then you get flash. You can change QSS, and then it's flash. That's what you use in Sonos flash. Stands for silicon oxide nitride oxide silicon. So. There you have a standard, uh, again, uh, a MOS, NMOS in this case, but you have a sandwich. Instead of a normal um, oxide layer, and for the gate oxide you have an oxide, a nitride and oxide. And these oxide layers, be, uh, above and below the nitride are called tunnel oxides. And the trick is that uh, with a high enough energy, you tunnel electrons into the uh, through the oxide into the nitride where it's trapped and then you shift the operation voltage the threshold of the transistor and when you then put an one at it it doesn't turn on anymore and that's essentially how the most used flash solution besides normal floating gate works it's really simple so <clears throat> and after you get your wells out of the furnace, so at the little, little detour, you want to make sure that the lateral diodes, which got into existence after diffusion, don't create unwanted short circuits. So we use a technology actually developed much later after one micron already has been out. It's called STI, shallow trench isolation. It's from the ULSI technology as well as the silicide we use to reduce the resistance of the polysilicon gates. Um, here are some pictures. Uh, we did etch, etch this one in the lab. That's the, the, the islands. So that around everything going down, that's the trenches in between the gates, uh, between the wells. So we isolate them from each other. So the receipt recipe is pretty easy. So either you have a plasma etcher around or if you are not rich and don't have money to buy a plasma etcher from eBay, you can also get this tetramethylammonium hydroxide um, and it's not even a German name a word, so cool. Uh, diluted with ionized wa or deionized water, 3 to 1, and this 25% um, a TMAH solution, you heat it up to 80 degrees Celsius, dip your wafer for in for six minutes, and then you get your structures. Metal is even easier. Um, so we did here the metal interconnect for the ring oscillator. Um, there, <laughs> etching it also, you make a vacuum. Deposit 100 nanometers aluminum, 30 nanometers titanium for passivation. Take the vacuum away, dip it into HF until you don't see streaks from the titanium. Then into aluminum match until you don't see streaks from the aluminum. And then you have your wires. Um, yeah, uh, I skipped that one. That's just really interconnect. Um, but um, I plan to make videos soon where I go through the uh, you know, like daily video block of results, but just that you see that you see the oxide depending on the angle, it has different colors. So that's LTO, the isolation. 
Uh, and then you see uh, our topological measurement device. Um, you see this mic one micron, uh, because we only deposited one micron for now. Um, and you see the, uh, the, the height the differences, and uh, we see that one micron is not enough. So we still have these sharp edges, which we don't want. So we have the, when I'm back in Hong Kong, I have to deposit another two microns. Um, and if you want to follow up, you go to my GitHub, okay? So Victor, that's him. And I have done that so far. It's only like two weeks because it took a lot of time to get all the, the, the masks manufactured and so a lot of bureaucracy. We already have that much and uh, just stay tuned. We already have figured out so much in the last two weeks that it shouldn't be uh, long before we can, well, finish. Uh, all the features of Pearl River, create, create uh, models uh, with Hagen's popcorn, um, and start start figuring out all the analog stuff for our MCU, and then make we make an MCU. That's the first thing we want to do as soon as, as we have the features figured out of, of Pearl River. If the goddess is nice to us. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's we uh, Discord we are figuring is really cheap on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, that's like the overall of the features. Uh, we want to build this microcontroller, and uh, yes, uh, because the other folks don't believe that there are people who want to buy such a MCU, please fill out the survey. Um, yeah, uh, that one is from Hagen. I skipped it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks. I'm done and. Uh, T too late, but sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Uh, now that it's too late, we have time for questions. So there are two microphones. One is in the middle and one is on the left side of the stage. Uh, line up and we're going to take some questions. And there is already one question from microphone number two. Um, <coughs> sorry. Thank you for that um, interesting talk and um, all the development that you're doing. I was wondering, um, have you had any time to test your uh, transistors yet? And then later on, do you plan to um, release some sort of analog um, simulation capabilities? Um, yes, that's uh, planned for the next few weeks after I'm back in Hong Kong. Um, we will go back into the clean room. We actually wanted to provide already something for the Congress. Unfortunately, uh, we were noticed, a short notice, that uh, Thursday and Friday they take the wet stations and the machines offline for maintenance of the AC. So um, um, we have already like the wafer, we have the isolation oxide, but we didn't have any time left to actually test the you know, only having polysilicon is not enough. You have to also have metal to go with probes there. The stuff is micron size. Okay, uh, the, your question, as I understand, was uh, in the direction of simulation, right? Uh, we like to measure all the structures we have to produce, and with the values we get, we like to feed in, in uh, SPICE models. So you can do uh, analog simulations. And yes, we like to use this technology for analog stuff. Because as I already mentioned, one micro size is enough for analog. You don't need smaller structures. Analog are always having huge transistor size for 20 or five micro, uh, 50 mi microns. So they are huge. You don't need the small technology. So they are quite um, feasible for analog stuff. But uh, let's say in this way, if you're doing analog stuff in a conventional way, you have to sign all the NDAs and you're stuck on this technology you're using. You can't transfer your design to the next fab because in the next fab, the PDK is a different. You have to uh, transfer or to translate all the structures you have or rebuild again for the new technology. If you have a technology which you can take from one fab to another, like other one, uh, our one, you are quite happy because the analog stuff you designed once also fits for the next fab. So yes, of course, we like to support analog stuff. 
we need help for that, of course. We have to measure. Uh, we are currently developing the wafer. We are currently working on the documents how to measure what we like to measure, and then we have to transfer the values to SPICE. But we have also document how we are doing that, and so everyone can use the knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, one, please. Uh, do you have any plans for open source mask production? Like, um, Yes, actually, the problem is only that, um, as I mentioned before, um, if you want to have an opto mask for staples, that's always manufacturer specific. If you want to have a direct transfer mask, um, not a problem. So I guess, so Sam is really helpful in the lab. Um, he runs the laser scriber. Um, we could talk with the folks at NFF. They were really lovely, helpful, uh, really, they really like to, uh, they really help us a lot. Um, and also now that we talk with RCL, and they also have laser scribers, um, there we could actually also start producing masks in the long run. So yes, that's certainly one of the things I intend to do is providing optical masks for exposure. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more question from microphone two. Hi, uh, yeah, great talk, thanks. Um, I'm really interested in the what it would take to build the fab. Uh, what's the minimum set of tools? We've already seen a couple of orders of cost reduction in um, sort of DIY biohacking by making the tooling a lot cheaper. Do you see that happening within the nearest decades in your, your sort of work? Um, yes, so for instance, I made my process by purpose this way that um, you can actually improvise most of it, like the LTO growing and the position and everything with a furnace. So what you need is a wet etcher, like some wet etch station. You can actually, uh, there is a video from Jerry Ellsworth called, called Making Microchips at Home Cooking with Jerry. And uh, she does uh, microchips in the kitchen. So. So it's not, uh, you, you get scared like HFS, it uh, dissolves your bones and so on. And then you see the guys who already have qualify, are qualified or employed there, they just, without any PP, nothing, just grab into the HF. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a skill to scare folks from generating uh, insurance problems. Um, in general, it's not really that dangerous, right? So you can do the stuff at home, no problem. Um, uh, and yeah, so we intend, uh, so it, it, this process I made is so trivial. So we have also a branch called uh, Super Low Tech, which has essentially, but that needs more r and but you could actually help there, for instance, uh, figure out the last details, get a furnace from eBay, put it on your kitchen table, start r and make some git pull, uh, pull requests and we're super happy <laughs> okay so it's doable and the furnace you get on ebay so it's not so a problem thank you microphone one again yes um so uh you you just said about the analog stuff that a lot of that is usually on their nda for the fab so have you encountered any problems with the fab um that you're currently using in that you're actually trying to discover these processes for yourself like you're generating competition that they might not like have you had any problems with that Oh no, I had a nice uh, phone calls, emails with the owner of the fab over in Taipo, uh, who also has a second brand in, 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 in Sanshan, that's RCL. I actually asked him recently, hey, is it okay when I use your uh, logo on, in the presentation and uh, implicitly make advertisement for your fab? And he, no, no prop, go ahead. <laughs> right? and so it's like, and we, uh, he's really eager to, uh, is Libra Silicon is what they need because every fab usually has to invest money to develop, at first they develop the proprietary process, right? Or they license some proprietary process from another uh, company. And then they have to invest R&D costs to develop IP costs for their setup. Um, with Libre Silicon, the problem is solved for the companies because um, these foundries using Libre Silicon, everything the community develops is on GitHub, and that's 
that's the IP catalog, essentially. So they don't have to invest any additional money into R and D and IP cores. That's in the nature of open source that there are IP cores popping into existence all the time. They can focus on the thing they're best at, making silicon. Right. So it's actually positive, but only for the small foundries that are really interested, especially Sanjay and uh, now some in India and so on. Um, but the big foundries, uh, they will not, uh, they anyway, the big companies have the tendency to be as mobile as a cargo ship. So it will take at least like two years until they haven't acknowledged that Libra Silicon exists. And then we might ex expect some legal, you know, bullying. But for now, they won't have them. They just laugh, right? They just laugh at best. Yeah. <coughs> we're going to have two more questions before we're out of time. Microphone two. Hi. Why did you go for the twin well process as opposed to the uh, simpler single well? <coughs> um, that's a good point. That's also something with portability. Um, if you have different vent or different supplier for a substrate, it might be that's an undoped or uh, undoped substrate. So with uh, twin well architecture, and actually we have on the end well we also built P bases, and in these N bases, uh, so we have actually like stacked wells in the end wells and P wells. On, so actually it's a one, two, three. Uh, 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 pentagon well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <coughs> and that's just that you can shift the 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 the, fra the, the, the doping of the N and the P substrate uh, according that you fit Libra silicon requirements to still have the physical properties ensured by Libra silicon, no matter whether you get your substrate from somewhere from Great Britain or from Taobao. Mm. Oh. Okay. Uh, the, the thing is, we looked before at eBay, which wafer we can get. Uh, currently, uh, NFF is supporting us with wafers. But if you're looking at eBay or t uh, Alibaba or what else, we get different wafers with di different dopations. And if you have something which say, okay, we're just building an annual, we have to verify or lie on the P base, right? Or on the P substrate. And to avoid the obstacle, the difficulties we're doing twin welds, we can just regulate our own uh, dopant inside and we are fine. We don't have to rely on the wafer or substrate itself. What was the basic point? Thank you. And the last question from microphone two. So once you have your complete die, how about uh, packaging and bonding? Because if you want to use it, you have to place it somehow on the PCB. Um, yes, so um, we have a bonding setup at Taipo already. That's what still is being used at the moment in Hong Kong is the bond uh, pa packaging. Then we have some guys in HKSDP with packaging setup. They even can make nice tape reels, and they have also like uh, after packaging tests. Like, did the bonding work? Is it damaged by the bonding, and so on. Um, Hagen and I, we figured out some nice bonding pad design, um, which didn't fit at all anymore into the talk. I already over talked like that. Um, but it uh, absorbs the uh, physical stress from bonding. So um, we think that and it's aluminum covered with titanium, so you don't have to sweat away any oxide, right? So you have better bonding capability, uh, better bonding properties. So it shouldn't be such a problem and we have plenty of bonding and packaging labs which have already promised to help us. So it's really like, it's more like to choose which one we take. <laughs> uh, just an annotation, uh, if you like a dedicated package, please mail us, right? We are fixed now on the dual inline package, we are uh, thinking about flip chip uh, BGA, but if you have other package which is more common for Tinkerer or something like that, please mail us. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. That was the talk on Libra Silicon. Leviathan, Chipforge, Andreas Westervik, and Victor. Thank you. Thank you.